You're listening to Let's Talk Macro. Brought to you by Bandhan Mutual Fund. Hello and welcome back everyone. You're catching me Ahalya on another episode of Let's Talk Macro. Uh, this is the podcast series by Bandhan Mutual Fund where we as you know discuss topical and relevant macro economic topics. Today joining us uh, as per usual is uh, Shrijit Balasubramanian, economist in the fixed income fund management team. Hi Shrijit, thank you so much for joining us once again. Hi Ahalya, how are you doing? doing very well and uh, she just today's conversation you know it's quite grand it's i think as okay. macro as they come because we're really uh, taking a look at the global economy you know in our previous yeah. episode we sort of talked about how the recovery in china post its reopening and yeah. uh, you know its economic growth has been kind of lackluster you know shying away from yeah. our expectations um, but at the same time we've also had a lot of strong data uh, from other parts of the world particularly the US. So today's mm. conversation is basically to focus on what's happening around the world especially in the US and Europe. Uh we're also going to touch upon, you know, uh India and other major economies through a summary of all the recent significant economic data which Shrijit you will be giving us. <laughs> yes. Um we're also going to look at the recent central bank monetary policy decisions, how market expectations for interest rates have moved and um what all of the data surprises really mean for the policy path ahead so shall we dive into it a lot to cover today sure let's go so let's begin with uh, i think the big one the us some of the sure. recent growth data here has been pretty strong and not in line with i think all of us were expecting some kind of a slowdown so do you want to just give us an overview of the situation there and why that's probably happening sure so first the uh, the banking sector issues if you remember in the us from march Mm-hmm. they uh, that seems to have settled for now although uh, credit growth has eased and uh, lending standards have tightened on the growth front we had quite a few data surprises to the upside uh, recent prints for durable goods orders university of michigan consumer sentiment conference board consumer confidence uh, retail sales were all higher than consensus expectation and uh, q and gdp growth was also revised higher recently uh, with consumer spending being stronger uh, one aspect here is the divergence between you know, uh, manufacturing and services so if you look at the purchasing managers indices the pmis for us both manufacturing and services pmis were rising during the initial part of the year with services being strong uh if you see in the last couple of months the divergence has actually increased with the manufacturing pmi falling although some regional surveys like the you know new york uh, empire state manufacturing index uh turned out to be stronger the other set of strong data is coming from the housing sector which is staging an early recovery of sorts after being hit by high mortgage rates from last year uh if you see the last few months again uh growth in the housing starts the housing market index uh, you know they have recovered mainly various measures of housing like uh housing sales actually like you know new single fam- uh, family homes sold and units sold above asking price and that has increased inventory and active listings for sale have fallen in. and the average time it typically takes for a residential property to be sold you know has started falling again but there are two things to really note here uh, one is that the commercial property sector is still not doing that great particularly the office space uh, you know with the exposure to a uh, higher exposure to smaller banks and the drop in availability of credit given issues with occupancy rates there and so on and uh, so the second thing is that the uh, some of the strong pick up in recent new home sales is because existing home sales or resales are down quite a bit uh, okay. so owners or sellers of existing homes if they want to purchase a new home they'll have to let go of the much lower mortgage rates they had logged in earlier and buy homes at the current much higher rates so mm. pace of resales is down quite a bit so housing in effect which is a very interest rate sensitive sector has bottomed out a bit recently so growth in the us like you said has held up better than expected and and this is also reflected in the uh, the economic outlook on the latest minutes of the fomc meeting if you see so it now sees the level of uh, real output moving below the staff's estimate of potential output only in early 2025 this was uh, 2024 in the previous minutes right and it also says the possibility of the economy continuing to grow slowly and actually avoiding a downturn is almost as likely as it is as its base case of a mild recession so overall uh, you know positive growth surprises in the us that's interesting shrijit so growth data and the housing sector particularly are doing quite well in the us uh, beating expectations yeah. very surprising like you said what do yeah. you think has been driving these surprises though and is this also going to have an impact on inflation given that is what central banks have been you know primarily looking at for a while now 
Yeah, so one main reason for the still quite strong consumption, like I said, we have spoken about this before, is the excess savings with households. Mm-hmm. This was uh, primarily from the heavy fiscal stimulus during the pandemic, you know, in the form of generous cash handouts and unemployment insurance, uh, and also the inability or unwillingness to go out and spend back then. So, according to our calculation, excess savings was around uh, 2.3 trillion dollars, uh, of which around 50% has been spent. So, roughly another 1 1.1 trillion remains. Now, this is an aggregate number at the economy level, and uh, savings with various income groups could be different. So, for example, it is possible higher income groups have more savings, and that their marginal propensity to consume is relatively lower. Mm-hmm. Despite this, the the current total excess savings is quite high, and there could also be a wealth effect from this, and even uh, the growth in stock market there recently. The other main driver is the labor market. Although it has actually been getting better, still quite tight compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, if you see non-farm payroll addition. that is mostly bet expectations almost every month for a while mm-hmm. monthly earnings growth is eased a bit but is again higher than pre pandemic and you know uh, the case is similar for job job openings to highs ratio uh, which is still quite elevated the unemployment rate and initial claims for unemployment insurance uh, has in fact only eased up a bit uh, so a good part of the recent strength is from the services sector which is remain strong so the labor market is still quite uh, some distance away uh, from being consistent with 2% inflation the us consumer price inflation has eased uh, from its high of peak at around 9.1 percentage last year and this is due to you know easing supply constraints soft energy prices base effects and some rotation in demand from goods to services rentals there is housing rentals have been easing so what is left and what the fed really focuses on now is the non energy non housing services which is the core uh, services so growth there has only been slightly slower so there is more scope there and and this part of cpi is really closely correlated with the the factors that we just discussed which is the labor market excess savings and wealth effect and so there is uh, you know uh, overall still some distance left all right so it's become clear that the us economy you know has been holding up better than expected um and yeah. because of that inflation particularly from the services side definitely still has some distance to go in terms of easing you know i think it's important to also move across now to europe what's the latest yeah. there on growth and inflation is it similar to the us are we tracking similarities or differences okay uh, so in the euro area growth related data has been weaker and that okay. is a key difference from us mm-hmm. uh, so quarter on quarter real gdp growth has been negative in the december and march quarters already manufacturing pmi has been falling and is much weaker than it was for the us industrial production economic sentiment and retail sales have been weaker than expected now this is particularly so for germany which is manufacturing oriented and so the data there like pmi is in factory orders have been weaker for households consumer confidence remains weak retail sales volume is falling uh, in even at the headline level and across categories and house prices have been easing so growth is clearly showing weakness there mm-hmm. however the labor market is tight even there uh, unemployment rate is lower than pre pandemic and at a historical low job vacancy rate is higher wages and salaries continue to move higher at a good pace and negotiated wage growth has been strong a good part of the strength is the you know is in the construction and services sector again as manufacture manufacturing is weak uh on inflation in the euro area apart from the supply constraints uh, energy played a major role but this has been coming off quite well uh food inflation which is a, another major driver has started to come off and more broadly prices of goods have been coming off but uh, excluding energy a part of it is uh, only a good part of it is only durables and in services inflation just like in the us continues to remain strong uh, so we actually compare us inflation to that in the euro area us cpi was at 4 percentage in may while euro area is at 6.1 percentage the us headline cpi peaked at 9 percentage in june last year while uh, for the ea it it peaked later in october 2022 at a much higher level of 10.6 percentage even core inflation peaked out very recently for the euro area like 6 uh, months after it did for the us so this as we mentioned is because goods disinflation in the uh, euro area started later and this has been shallower and uh, goods also have a much higher weight in the cpi basket for the euro area right meanwhile uh, services inflation remains strong so for the euro area when compared with the us growth data has been weaker but labor market is similarly strong and uh, inflation is again coming off but at a slower pace 
Again, I think uh, kind of counterintuitive that the key difference uh, recently is on growth. Um, US data has been surprising to the upside, while the euro area to the downside. And you know, given that we've had many conversations actually from the policy perspective, Shijit, how do you think policy, you know, monetary policy is reacting to um, both of these scenarios? And you know, how are the Fed and the European Central Bank, the ECB, adjusting their narrative and course of action? In, given the surprises <laughs> coming their way, the uh, the Fed has acknowledged strong domestic growth, mm-hmm. uh, the strong labor market, and the slow progress in core services disinflation, but also the likely uh, impact of credit tightening from the banking sector issues in March. Uh, so, if you look at the FOMC statement, or if you look at what the FOMC did in March, uh, FOMC hiked rates by 25 basis points. But it changed its statement, which previously said, you know, ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. Uh, they actually changed it to some additional policy firming may be appropriate. Despite strong data, it also left uh, unchanged the median Fed funds rate projected for the end of this year. Later in May, it again hiked by 25 basis points, but it dropped the line which said some additional policy firming may be appropriate. However, it continued to push against aggressive rate cuts markets had, you know, priced in. In June, which is at the latest meeting, it paused after hiking rates in almost uh, in exactly 10 consecutive meetings by a total of uh, 500 basis points to assess additional information and the cumulative impact of hikes done so far, uh, you know, which acts with lags. But it clearly said additional policy firming may be required. Uh, the July meeting is live increased its median projection for the Fed funds rate for 2023 this year by 50 basis points. So most likely two more hikes of 25 basis points each. And it increased even the 2024 projected rate to suggest uh, fewer cuts. So it is a hawkish skip in that sense. And uh, the fiscal debt ceiling fear is also out of the way now. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, markets have increased their interest rate expectations again uh, back to where it was uh, before the banking sector issues. So bond deals have risen, magnitude of yield inversions uh, has risen again and strong growth is giving the Fed that space uh, really to stick to its job. Uh, The ECB on the other hand has acknowledged weaker growth easing energy prices and tighter credit conditions, but Mm -hmm. also the persistent underlying price pressures and the upside risk to inflation uh, from tight labor market and strong wage growth, particularly in the services sector. So in its latest meeting in June, it said barring any material changes to its baseline, it'll hike again in the next meeting in July. So the challenge for the ECB is that it started hiking in July last year, four months after the Fed did. Uh, and it potentially also faces slightly divergent economic situation uh, in countries. So, for example, we discussed the German data being you know, weaker than the rest of the euro area. Right. And therefore, it also faces uh, divergent fiscal policies in the countries. Uh, however, it's, it, it's very likely that uh, overall it is the last phase of rate uh, hikes in the cycle for the Fed and the ECB after a historic pace in magnitude. Uh, but it is weaker growth that really differentiates Europe. Okay, so essentially, uh, the Fed skipped a hike in the recent meeting, but future hikes are still very much on the table, right? Part of this uh, <laughs> this yeah. hand of cards. The ECB, on the other hand, uh, you mentioned, continued to hike and could do it again in its next meeting. So one main difference in what they're looking at, again, is growth. So I think that's an interesting point that details where we are in the cycle. So thanks for taking um, us through the US and Euro area. You know, we could also benefit from a quick look at what's happening in other parts of the world right now. After all, it is all very connected. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So the other main economy is China. So like you mentioned, we discussed uh, that in detail in the previous episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, But just to summarize, we we spoke about China already slowing pre-pandemic and uh, then the pandemic uh, property sector issues and power crunch adding to this while uh, the policy response there was quite measured and targeted. The reopening this year has turned out to be soft as consumer demand is weak. Mm -hmm. Uh, Property sector is still struggling and global growth is set to slow. And the wait for any meaningful policy response there to address consumer demand continues. Let's look at a few other economies. So uh, in the UK, for example, we've had many issues uh, from shortage of labor, tax cuts in the mini budget late last year, most of which are later reversed, tight labor market and still high inflation. So core inflation there is still rising, unlike the uh, US and Euro area, and it was above 7 percentage in May, with services being very strong. Uh, the Bank of England hiked its policy rates by 50 basis points in June. It has uh, flagged the persistent inflationary pressures there and that further hikes could be needed. And markets also, if you see, have you know aggressively uh, priced in more hikes now. Uh, 
in australia inflation is likely past its peak and the labor market is eased but mm-hmm. still work in progress central bank paused rate hikes this month to assess the economy and risk to the outlook uh, but again said some further tightening may be required another interest rate sensitive advanced economy sweden where uh, right. disinflation has been very slow uh, but growth data has been coming in weaker with consumer demand falling uh, so its central bank hiked policy rates again by 25 basis uh, points in june citing the need to further dampen demand and you know given the risk to inflation from weaker currency there uh, so that's really on some of the advanced economies coming to uh, emerging markets so indonesia central bank for example has left its policy rate unchanged in the last five meetings as inflation has been falling philippines is also paused as inflation eased but this was again also due to some government price controls on food mm-hmm. in malaysia also inflation is easing but some of the fall is uh, i mean here also it's due to government subsidies uh, central bank here has actually you know paused earlier this year it hiked in may which is a one off and then it is paused again this month right and if you look at vietnam uh, manufacturing and export growth there has really slowed and and so has inflation and mm-hmm. the central bank has already cut rates there thrice since april and and finally if you look at our domestic situation so for india mm-hmm. our march quarter gdp growth was better than expected current account deficit is improved although the recent goods and services monthly trade data weakened uh, gst collections and portfolio inflows have been buoyant uh, and our corporate and banking sector balance sheets are generally you know uh, are healthier now so that's it uh, but the other side of it is that uh, consumer durables production has been a bit weak uh, mm-hmm. in general rural economy is not doing that well and there are potential risks on the horizon from an el nino which is you know through lo- a lesser monsoon season rainfall i think we have discussed this before and uh, also from slower global growth ahead so the rbi has paused after rate hikes but it has flagged inflationary pressures in the second half of this financial year and the need to progressively align inflation with the 4% target uh, essentially if we take a step back uh, most of the advanced economies are still facing higher inflation driven more by services but it is mostly off its peak so central banks there are somewhere in the final phase of rate hikes in the cycle but there is again some divergence among countries based on where inflation currently is versus target expected uh, trajectory of disinflation and growth uh, on the other hand some of the emerging market central banks have paused after rate hikes as inflation eases but some of these economies are you know are structurally more sensitive to food prices oil prices the inflation there is impacted by government subsidies and so on uh, but it will be really important uh, for these emerging economies to ensure economic stability in this uh, phase Brilliant, uh, Shrijit. That was such a comprehensive overview and a really useful summary on, um, you know, the global macro and central bank actions. So we've covered the U.S., uh, the Euro area, China, the U.K., and also yeah. summarized what's kind of happening in advanced and emerging economies from both of those perspectives. I guess the the last thing to cover um, is, okay. you know, just maybe three key takeaways one should have from this discussion. discussion it was a very extensive one so uh, what are the three focus points you think will be really important to keep okay. an eye on sure so one growth continues to surprise to the upside in the us but not everywhere it has been to the downside in the euro area two labor markets are still quite tight by various measures in many advanced economies particularly in the services sector mm-hmm. and this will have an impact on disinflation which is progressing but slow the challenge in fact could be the final leg of disinflation after you know easing from the very high readings towards the central bank's inflation targets uh, three monetary policy has responded aggressively and central banks are likely in the last leg of hikes in the cycle as they also evaluate the lagged impact of hikes Mm. some of the emerging market central banks of past on uh, their rate hikes as inflation has eased so the question on policy rates therefore is shifting from how much further to how long and when cuts come into the equation uh, later that is eventually uh, you know what will matter is the long term neutral rate for each economy so this is the interest rate at which uh, policy is neither accommodative nor restrictive and uh, you know is impacted by various factors like productivity savings investments and so on so the estimate of the neutral rate uh, whether this has changed post the pandemic so for example some studies for the us suggest you know this hasn't really changed since the pandemic and it continues to be low mm-hmm. uh, so uh, depending on that uh, and also depending on where actual rates are versus the neutral rate you know this will uh, aid the assessment of whether policy is restrictive or accommodative and this will really guide the future policy direction Okay all right thank you so much Srijit um I think those are uh, you know three good takeaways for us to keep an eye out for 
and it's not easy to really capture all that's happening in the global economy because i mean yeah. you know like we always say so many moving parts thank you yeah. to all of our listeners as well for tuning in i hope uh, you know you've been able to take something of value out of this a podcast we will be back with another episode of let's talk macro uh, but in the meantime yeah just soak up all of the insights from this episode bye thank you mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully